How are you feeling without having football in your life right now? <laughs> I feel like I've got more time available to myself, a I little know. bit more peace of mind, a little bit less distraction in my day, <laughs> which is, I miss it. You yeah. know, I miss football, but it's nice to have all of my bandwidth for myself. Well, Pat's show did just come back on. So that distraction is, you know, a little bit back in place, but. Pat's show, it's the Pat McAfee show is the um, main source of sports media that we consume uh, outside of Twitter updates. Mm -hmm. So um, Mad Mel is back. Oh, it yeah. is drafts, it's draft extravaganza. I can't wait for the episode in which the draft <laughs> transpires. I'm sure it's going to be an electric episode. Oh, yeah. Um, but we love Pat McAfee. And so it's nice to have him back those two weeks. They always go <laughs> on a they always go on a break every year. After the Super Bowl, they have a two week hiatus. And it feels weird because I, I watch them literally every five day. days a week <laughs> for months, especially during the season and before the season starts. And so to have that two week break, it's kind of weird because I generally just have it on in the background a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's always very interesting. Yeah. It, it's hard when you go from we would always like catch up on Pat clips, be talking about everything, and then going into basically nothing. And since football season, it's over. It's like, what do I do with this time that I now have? Yeah. But I vividly remember before I was super into football that you were watching the draft spectacular and you were just dying laughing. And all I heard was like somebody just screaming at the camera. And it was like so overstimulating for me. And I was just like, why does he think this is so funny because I hadn't really met Mad Mel yet yeah. and all the different, you know, Jay Glazer hadn't met all the different characters that came through. And now I just have a deep appreciation for it. For those that do not watch the show, <laughs> what we're referring to is that um, Ty Schmidt, who is a main character of the Huge Pat Packers show. fan, which yeah. we love. I don't say, I, I say character in the sense of like, he's on the show every day. He does impersonations of the um, individuals who break news for football. And so he does an amazing impersonation of Jay Glazer, who is a, the NFL network um, person. And then he also does an amazing, <laughs> an amazing uh, impersonation of Mel Kuyper, who is the draft uh, analysis for the for ESPN and both of those impersonations are spectacular. He also does an amazing <laughs> Lou Holtz. Yeah. It's probably his best one. Lou Holtz is, I don't know, Mad Mel is up uh, there. I don't know. The Lou Holtz, the the one where he's by the fire and like reading the note. And then when they did it with Lou Holtz, that was just incredible TV. Yeah, that was fantastic. I would say Mad Mel. Lou, and then Jay Glazer. But what about his Nick Sirianni one is also His Nick Sirianni is strong so too. Um, I guess he, that and the Jay Glazer are probably tied, but the uh, Lou Holtz and the Mad Mel are top tier. Yeah, he does a good MCDC too. Yeah. You know, he's just all around very talented. He is. And very smart because, I mean, he's a huge Packers fan. He's also a part owner like us. Yeah. So we have a lot in common. I they, they make the comment that he's a Harvard, he was accepted to Harvard. I have no idea if that's true or not. They have so many inside jokes that they just present on a day-to-day -day basis that that could very well be true or it could be 100% a fallacy, <laughs> but he could be that smart. <laughs> Well, I want to get into training today and be able to go over some updates for both you and I of what we've been had going on. So um, if people haven't been following along on YouTube, you have been training for a half marathon. I have been. So give us a little bit of an update, and then I'm going to ask some more questions, but just go ahead and give us a general update here of how things are going, how many weeks in you are, how many weeks out, what does that look like? Okay. So with the running, it's probably been about a year since I picked it up and I've been able to run a couple of 5Ks. I've been able to run, I, I would say the longest distance that I've ran throughout the training has been either five or six miles. Um, the training itself has been really fun. Uh, I also, like along side of that was getting into yoga. So it's been about a year since I've gotten into yoga and then taking running more seriously. Um, both of those things have been fantastic for me. At this point, this coming Saturday, I will be seven weeks out from the half marathon. Now, I have ran into a little bit of a, a speed bump here. Uh, I injured my ankle in some capacity about two and a half weeks ago at this point. Um, I don't know exactly what happened. It was after a run. Uh, I had started running and I realized that I was on a sidewalk that was not like flat and it was kind of, 
I don't know. Sloped. It was sloped, but it was because the concrete had like settled in a weird way. Mm -hmm. So part of the sidewalk was level and then part of it was sloped. And I realized that my ankle was bothering me probably after being on this uh, sidewalk that was sloped for over half a mile. And it was really bothering me. And so then I ended up cutting the run short that day, just thinking that I may have tweaked it and I just needed to rest because after that run, my ankle was extremely swollen. And so then I gave it about three days of rest. It was really stiff and I didn't have a whole lot of overall mobility. So I continued to give it rest. The swelling did come down um, and I had backed off of my daily steps as well. Like I was really just trying to give myself as much rest as humanly possible. Um, I tried to run again and immediately it just swelled up. And so I've tried to run now twice in that two and a half week time frame. And the, uh, <laughs> after each of those, my ankle has swelled quite a bit. And then, uh, I've lost quite a bit of mobility and it's extreme, like my calf, my soleus, everything is really tight afterwards. So unfortunately, I think that there's something more going on than just simply giving it rest at this moment, which is extremely frustrating. And throughout my entire life, I have not backed out of a single physical activity. I've never given myself the opportunity to quit a physical endeavor, whether it be a sport growing up or it be um, a bodybuilding competition, anything that I've said I was going to do, I've done it. And this would be the first thing that I would have to, I don't, I, I wouldn't be quitting on the half marathon. It would be more of a situation where I'd have to postpone because mm -hmm. I'd still would want to run it. I just need to figure out what's going on with my ankle yeah. um, and get an, a clear answer of exactly what I'm dealing with at the moment, which is extremely frustrating because I'm really excited about it. And it's not like there's just half marathons um, every single weekend here in Columbus. Like there's, I think there's only two or three that I have found. I'm sure that there are more, but from what I've seen so far, there's not this like, abundance that I can just jump into like a 5k, like literally every mm -hmm. weekend I can find no a 5k <laughs> um, or a 10k somewhere happening. And so that's a little frustrating. I'm just, you know, staying even keeled alongside the half marathon. I've continued to resistance train four days a week, which has been great. Um, but continue with your questions. <laughs> well, first I do want to say I am so outstandingly proud of you for taking the ankle thing seriously, because you are someone who does want to push the limits, and I very much so appreciate that about you, but you sometimes do cross that line, and then it's really hard to come back from, and I know that if you do have to postpone it, that is going to be an extremely hard decision to make because you are so excited for it, and you have done everything that you would need to do leading up to it, and it's something where like, I hope you don't, you do know that you're not actually quitting within this. Um, and you're doing an incredible job of making sure that your body is in the best spot. Because if you are to get less mobile, then that would be just bad for your mental health and your physical health. So I'm just really proud of you for really giving yourself the rest and being mobile in other ways that you can. Thank you. It is a process of doing what I don't want to do. Um, <laughs> I, I preach that, but then in instances like that, I often would just push past and say, well, this is what I want to do anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, and that has paid dividends, you know, up until this point, for the most part, there have certainly been injuries that I've tried to push through that have been very dumb in the past. Um, but this is one that I can tell is more than what I want to kind of play with. Mm -hmm. Because I know that any injury of greater significance to my ankle is something that is going to really throw me for a loop. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to have any you know, uh, surgery, time off, anything of that nature. I want to avoid any possibility of that. And so, um, that's why I'm playing it much more cautiously than I would any other tweak of any sort. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into some questions and not that I want you to ignore the ankle, but just kind of being able to talk about the process so far, um, without having a lot of caveats since we've already talking about the ankle. Sure. Uh, so when it comes to nutrition, is there anything that you feel like you didn't know going in? into it or things that you've learned that you've had to have in place for nutrition with still training regularly and training for the half marathon? I don't think there was anything I didn't know. I 
underestimated the amount of focus that it would take. I, I treated it as something where, because if you think about like a bodybuilding competition, it's very easy to get into the track of like, this is all that I'm focusing on. Everything is, is centered around when I'm training, when I'm getting my cardio in, when I'm eating my meals. Whereas right now, my life is centered around my work. And that doesn't change whether I want it to change or not. Like that is what this phase of my life is currently. And so I underestimated the amount of focus that I needed around nutrition specifically to get in enough food to recover from the training, but also recover from the runs themselves. So getting on a very strategic game plan of when I'm eating and sticking to that and not pushing it back of like, well, I have this meeting or I have this call and I've got to, I'll, I'll wait to eat the next meal when that thing's over. Um, being more timely with my meals was probably the thing that I had to put myself in check with the fastest because it was noticeably causing issues because I'd get to the end of the day and I would just be behind on food and it'd be tough for me to catch up. When it came to your food of, let's say, when you were just training before, and I know you said you had to have more focus, but was there an increase of food within the uh, running? Because with the running, you obviously cut back a little bit on training to make space for that. Uh, but was there a big increase that you had within food or was it just that focus you had to have? There was a pretty decent increase. I think we increased like a little over 300 calories daily um, to the total intake as well as like it was something for me where I wasn't worried about gaining a little bit of body fat or, or change in body composition. All I cared about was my performance improving. Mm -hmm. So I was good if I needed to gain a little bit of body fat for me to perform better within the training, within the the runs, so be it. Um, so I, I wasn't hung up on that, but I would say, I think it was a little, I was around 300 calories. What are some of the strategies that you've implemented to ensure that you can have that focus on food, whether it's moving around to when you eat your meals or just different snacks you have in place? What does that look like? Well, number one, I don't wait for for you to eat with me. I think that that is one thing that I've given up on and we've tried forever, I feel like, to, yeah. to try and time up our lunch because we eat breakfast together, which is great. And then we've tried to time our lunches, but have realized over the last year that <laughs> it's just not you know, yeah. in the equation. If we are lucky enough to do it, awesome. But more often than not, it's not possible. So I generally eat meals two and three on my own. And then meal four, we generally have together. So meal four and meal one we'll have together. And then those two meals in between, um, I'll have on my own. And then I have snacks in between there. And I think that's been the biggest help for me is finding snacks that are actually satiating to me, uh, not snacks that just allow for me to be satiated for three seconds and then I'm more hungry and now I'm distracted trying to get through before my next meal type situation. What are some of those? So the combo of the Chobani complete shakes, mm -hmm. banger, um, banger, with the Nash bar, both of those combined chef's kiss. 40 grams of protein. Bingo. Just like that. Bingo. Bingo. Yep. Um, it's fantastic from a snack perspective. I've got so many of my clients on it. I'm getting tagged in it every single day. <laughs> Just the immediate Alex Bush snack special, which is not even really me. It's more Sue. But I appreciate- You will take credit for it. I will. And I feel like I recommend it in every single check-in. I'm like, here, you need to buy the Nash bars. You need to buy the Chobani Complete. Um, and we need to keep Chobani understanding that the, the Chobani Complete is important because yeah. they discontinued the Don't actual get me yogurt. They just have the Shobani, shakes now. If you are listening to this, bring back the yogurt. That was the only, only lactose-free yogurt that actually had the consistency of yogurt, not some liquidy mess that people try to pass off in these dairy-free yogurts and actually have protein in it. Because a lot of the dairy-free yogurts, it's like, hey, here's 50 grams of fat and two grams of protein. And it's like, I didn't want this. And now it's a soupy mess. Bingo. I want the Chobani Complete lactose-free freaking yogurt back in my life. But I will at least be thankful that the shakes are there, even though sometimes they're sold out all the time. But I will still be grateful. The other snack is just legion protein mm -hmm. with some cereal. It's yeah. a very easy, like get a serving or two of cereal, throw that in a small bowl and then have uh, two scoops of protein and I'm on my way. Name the goaded cereal right now. I don't know. We haven't had a box of cereal in forever. This is what happens. Sue puts them in these nice containers with these black airtight. lids. Airtight. They're fantastic. But I haven't seen a box of cereal in a long time. So I don't know exactly what I'm eating, but it tastes good. It's the honey checks. The honey Those checks. Those are goaded. For sure. If you you put me in the in the in the uh, what is it called? Cereal aisle. Cereal aisle. No, I'm talking about in the house, oh, bro. The kitchen. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you put me in front of where the cereal is at. Okay. I'm going to be able to point to which one. I don't know what it is, though. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to guess it's the Honey Nut Checks because that one bangs. I will say that I tried the Maple Brown Sugar Checks, and I was really hoping it was going to be more brown sugar than maple because, like, maple isn't, like, my favorite flavoring, but it's very heavy maple. So I'm just trying to, like, get through it so we don't waste it. But the Honey Nut reigns supreme. Any other snacks that you have been loving or have been go-tos for you? I'm still on the midday squares, but I don't really have those as a snack. Those are kind of just an added on to a meal mm -hmm. type chocolate. So I like to have that. Um, that's about it. What about those fruit snacks? I'm not down with the fruit snacks that much anymore. Oh, I'm still on fruit snack kick. Those I really yammer. despise them, how they get stuck in my teeth like I'm over it. <laughs> I don't really run into that. Well, so. you're better than me. <laughs> According to a recent survey, 71% of women said they want to increase their glute size. And I get it because I was a part of that 71% until I got my hands on the PD Glute Program. It is a 16-week program, but we have the first four weeks available for free. And just in case you don't believe us, you don't have to just take my word for it. Take Nicole's word, who said, this 12-week program is unreal. I'm a trainer myself, but holy shit. This glute program is mind blown emoji. I have never felt my glutes engage this much. Or take Kinsey's word for it, who said, the workout has been challenging but straightforward, which is great. I have always loved training legs, but never had a clear plan, so this has been very beneficial. I've seen a noticeable difference in my glutes and legs. It's kind of crazy how well it's been working. So head to the show notes below to access the first four weeks of the PD Glute Program for free and get results like Nicole, Kenzie, and the thousands of others who have said the same. Uh, so when it comes to the recovery within the training and the running, were there any surprises for that recovery that you ran into or different considerations you had to put in place after you got started? Yeah, it was terrible at the beginning. <laughs> like trying to train consistently and run well was not fun um because i i didn't know how to structure it well i think that it would have probably been in my best interest to work with a specific coach who had an understanding in the resistance training and also within the running not to say that my coach adam is not in that but i i do think that his and having two separate coaches, someone who's handling the running and then someone who's handling the training, it probably would be better if I had someone who was doing both mm -hmm. um, or people that corresponded better because it's I'm I'm relaying messages, which isn't the best way to do it. Um, so I'm learning on that side, but figuring out how I could train legs twice a week because I do enjoy having the leg training twice a week. And then being able to run, you know, 20 plus miles a, a week is, was, and has been very challenging. Um, so at the beginning, I think my recovery was garbage uh, for a couple of different reasons. It's not just simply the training volume and then also the running volume. It had things to do with my stress, how I was going about my sleep, those different things being a much larger rock as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of hurdles. If you had to give advice to someone who is going to be doing both within the training and the running, what would be your main piece of advice or even main things to focus on when it came to uh, implementing both? I would pick a priority between the two. I think that I have such strong expectations for myself that I am expecting myself to continue to excel in the resistance training side and continue to add muscle tissue while also making big strides within running. And I have realized as I've continued to beat my head against a wall through the front end of this, of getting prepared for this half marathon, um, that I've got to prioritize one or the other. So I would encourage to prioritize as much as you want to, to get the most out of both things, prioritize the running if that's what's most important to you, and then have the training be supplement or yeah, be supplementary to your running and then vice versa if that's, you know, where your importance is. Have there been any unexpected joys with adding running back into your life? Because from my knowledge, your running before looked very different than, and your life looked very different than it does now. So how has that been for running? Well, when running was more consistent in my life, I would have been in high school slash college. And so playing football, it was all sprint-based work. So that wasn't a big deal uh, or not comparable, I should say. And then when we look at uh, baseball, my high school coach 
was basically a cross country coach. So that was very similar. Now at that time, I'm 40 pounds lighter than I am now. So mm -hmm. big difference on that side. I could run for a very long period and, and had um, great endurance with running at that time because of how crazy my coach was. Love him to death. I still keep in contact with him, but he was more of a cross country coach in the conditioning side of things. Um, that carried over into college. My college coach was also quite crazy with distance running as well. They saw it more from a recovery standpoint. So we did a lot of distance running. Um, so at that time, but again, I'm like 170, 180 pounds. Then now I'm between 205 and 210 has been kind of the weight that I've been running at. Um, so different for sure. It's been harder, uh, because I, at that time I was just good at it right off the bat. And then now it's like, I've had to really put in effort to my, uh, running execution, how I'm running. And then also, uh, I have not been able to just to pick it up and run and, and do it day after day. I've had to really be mindful of my recovery. Mm -hmm. With uh, working with Aaron some when you were learning some of the aspects of the running and strengthening, uh, what did it come to for different musculatures that you had to strengthen uh, to be able to excel in running or just to be able to have feel the best when you're running? So I had an, an quite the imbalance between my gastroc, which is more of the the ball portion of your calf that's more closer to your knee. I had an imbalance of strength from my gastroc to my soleus and soleus is what's running up behind the gastroc and then is, is towards more of your ankle. What's going to be, well, we'll leave it at that. It's behind there. <laughs> and then you have what is on the front side of your shin, which is your anterior tibialis. And that's going to be something where I was also weak. So I was weak through my soleus. I was weak through my anterior tib. And so both of those things have been a focal point for us from a strengthening perspective, improving stability through my ankle. Those were big focal points within the exercises I'm still doing today. Mm -hmm. Now with focusing more on running, and like you said, you really enjoy training and you had to pick that focus. Did you experience any body comp changes that were either ones you were excited about or maybe not so much? Um, I don't, I don't think so. My, my, weight was going down and then we were able to get my food aligned and then my scale weight started to trend a little bit back up. And once my weight started to trend back up, that was something where I just felt better from a performance perspective. I don't know quite yet of any negative body composition changes that I have thought about, at least off the top of my head. Um, I imagine that my legs have come down a little bit in terms of size, just because of the pure beating that some of these weeks have taken, especially early on when I was, I think 14 to 16 miles a week, which doesn't seem like a lot, but from where I was, it, it was, like a lot. <laughs> um, 14 to 16 miles and then still hitting legs pretty heavily twice a week was really tough on me. And I didn't feel like I was ever recovering, which, uh, from a coaching perspective is like, Hey man, you should probably back off somewhere. But for me, it's like, I just need to get acclimated. I'm just getting acclimated. <laughs> um, and you know, lo and behold, I've backed off and it's all, my recovery has been much better. Mm -hmm. Do you listen to music while you're running or podcasts or something else? I kind of bounce around. I feel like it's either music or I'm listening to nothing. Uh, I'm trying to get to a place where I'm listening to nothing for the sheer fact of it is a really good hour ish for me to navigate through my thoughts and just be present with myself uh, because I have so much of stimulus going on throughout the day, whether it be um, computer or it be um, my phone, being around other people. Like I have a lot of stimulus and input that I'm around. And so running and lifting are two places where I'm able to really just be in my own thoughts. And, um, so I try to take advantage of that as much as I can, but sometimes the music is necessary for me to just to get into the groove. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy running alone or do you like running with someone? Man, my best runs have been with Miguel and with Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that I enjoy running with someone else, uh, just for the push as well as the conversation, because having the conversation allows for me to pace better. I feel like if uh, I guess one thing to kind of add to that is that by having the conversation it allows for me to pace better. One thing that I despise within my pacing is looking at my watch during the run, because then I'm aware of like how close I am to the next mile or where my mile time is at, which is, you know, can be good. But then I try to 
it, it immediately makes me more competitive. And then I just try to push to finish the mile at a faster pace than what it's showing me. Kind of like when you're in your car and you type in the location that you're going to and you're like, I can get there a few minutes before Siri says. Like, <laughs> she's dumb. I know better than her. I can get there a few minutes before. It's the same thought process. So um, yeah, those those things are important. Would you say pacing yourself has probably been one of the most difficult things within running? Especially early on. I think I've gotten a better hang of it. I'm not great at it yet, but I'm much better than I was because at the beginning I was just trying to run as best or as hard as I could and beating mile times. Cause that's where I started was just like running my, like one mile and then just trying to beat my time in that one mile. And so then that being my starting point, I kind of let that bleed into now I'm doing two miles, three miles and beyond. So I've gotten to a much better place now. What was the main push or reason for you wanting to do the half marathon? It is a competitive realm that I'm going to be able to do over the long haul. This seems like something that I can do for 10, 20 years and, and pass that and continue to have that competitive itch for myself. Um, and it, it allows for me to do other things as well. Like I, I have I have a desire to do the half marathon specifically because it feels to me um, that I can still manage and do other things. Like I can still train hard and have results there, even though I just talked about how I need to prioritize <laughs> the half marathon more. Um, but I feel like if I push into marathons, then it's like all I'm doing is focusing on the marathon training. And then if I was to go into even furthermore, like triathlons, that would be something where it's like a massive, massive, massive dedication of my time. And I don't feel like I have the bandwidth to do that um, or the desire. So the half marathons seem like the thing that allow for me to scratch that competitive itch, but also maintain the balance in the other aspects of my life. I think it would be really fun to do like the, um, what are they called? Partner triathlons or like a... Uh... I don't know what they're called, but where it's uh, like the each person is doing one of the three things. I think that would be fun to be able to do. So you're saying one person does the swim, one person does the bike, and one mm -hmm. person does the run. Which one do you want to do? The, I'll do the swim. You'll do the swim. Oh, for sure. Open water. Yeah. Dude. I'll do swim. Way over running. I, I would go between swim or bike. I would never choose run first. I would do the run or the bike. Yeah. I would definitely do the run or the bike. Um, not I wouldn't swim. I think that, I mean, it may be a hilarious YouTube video for us to do like a Sue teaches Alex how to swim. <laughs> or just Sue versus Alex swimming. No, we don't need to do a verse. That's, that would be a waste of everyone's time. I think it would be funny. You would destroy me. I think it would be funny. Do we, do, I mean, what, what should we do for me then? We can do Sue versus Alex running and then you can destroy me. Okay. Uh, but I, th I think that the margin is still much larger with swimming. So <laughs> I, I need something else. <laughs> Should we do like a squat competition? No. Why? My body isn't made for squatting. Yours Mine is. Mine is not meant for swimming. Yes, it is. You just don't know how. Yes, it is. You're, you don't know how to squat. I do know how to squat, and we have <laughs> talked about it not being the best for my limb legs. If I can use the safety bar, then maybe. Okay. Maybe we do that. But how are we gauging that? Because you can obviously squat way more than me. Is it in reference to your body weight or? Maybe we do like um, squatting your body weight, how many reps you can do. Okay. Sh should I go ahead and lose like 30 pounds <laughs> <laughs> or what? I don't know. Then do you want to squat half your body weight? No, then I'll be a little puss. Exactly. But what about pull-ups? How many pull-ups do you think you can do right now? With this, I mean, we haven't even talked about my elbow. <laughs> yeah, your we elbow's haven't talked about my elbow. Broke. <laughs> So uh, my let's do a pull-up competition. <laughs> <laughs> my elbow is getting better though. Um, I think we could do the pull-up. I think I could do like 15 continuous. Oh, then I don't want to do pull-ups. I think I could do 50. At this current body weight, I could probably do 15. I, I don't think I could get 15. But I could only do one set. It would be like I'd have a really quick warm-up and then I'd crank 15 and I'd be done. I could probably... If I really tried, get to 10, but I do not think I could get Like, I think that. I could do 15, and then if I was to try and do a second set, I don't think I'd get eight. Yeah. I think it would, I, there'd be such a drop off because I, it's not something I'm consistently doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I've got one really solid set Ooh, in me. We could do a free throw shootout too. We can absolutely do that. Yeah. I will destroy you. I got to get my nails trimmed down. Nope. Nails. No. 
I got to give them trimmed down. Go ahead and get that ball rolling off the fingers. <laughs> rolling off the fingers, snapping off Ooh, those nails. we could do also a golf thing in there too. No, I think the golf is disqualified. What? How about we do a, like a batting cage? I can like whack that out of the park. Whack that out of the park in the batting cage? No, in the golf. Okay. Well, we'll do the golf and we'll do the batting cage. Then Are, those is just gonna be the, out. Is this going to be the Physique Development Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> Might be. Who knows? <laughs> I think when we have the the staff in town. Oh my gosh! The PD Olympics. I don't know about that. <laughs> Top golf, just cranking. Oh my goodness. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Anything else about the half marathon training um, that you want to talk through? Um, hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm in a frustrated state about it all. I want to get this my ankle situation figured out so I can have a clear path and not in this state of limbo of like, are we needing to pull back? Are we going to push forward in the next seven weeks to make it happen? I'd like to have clear answers. So Understandable. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing, turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty? I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Let's dig into your training. Okay. Let's put you on the hot seat. All right. Okay. What's going on with your training? What are you focusing on well, at this moment? You know, I was going to do a half marathon and I was all in, all for it, um, was making the plans to go to Green Bay to, you know, run through Lambo and just live my dreams out. Uh, and I- Live your dreams out. Could you expand on that? Going- being on Lambeau Field. So the the half marathon you were going to run was going to have you running through Lambeau Field? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that was the only reason I was doing it. I, I don't, I would have not been like, yeah, I'm going to do the half marathon in Columbus. I would have been like, no, I'm not signing up for that. But as soon as I learned I could do it at Lambeau, then I was like, yeah, I'm in. Amazing. Yeah. So I was, I started running for it. I started going to James, which is a neuromuscular therapist in town because I had some issues with my hips being a little bit twisted. And I wanted to really get that nailed down before I started putting miles in because my background within running is I don't really run <laughs> and I haven't ran in like 10 years. And even when I was running, I did do track all through middle school and high school. But when I got to high school, I really focused on pole vaulting. And so the most I had to run was like 70 feet. And so I didn't really ever do ever distance. And I don't think I ever really nailed down my running form as a whole. So just running was never my thing. But I was like, you know what? I like to challenge myself, like to learn new things. Why don't I give it a shot? And so started getting my running volume up, started working on my hips. And then it kind of came to a place in early February where I was getting started with round two of the glute program and within gearing up with increasing my training volume because I hadn't been training as much, I was realizing how much it was taking a toll on me and it got to a point of feeling like, do I even have the recoverability to do the glute program? And then with that, it was like, how am I going to fit the running in and still be able to recover from it? And I had a conversation with you about it just because, like you, I didn't want to quit or bail on something that I said I was going to do. And it was a really helpful conversation just because you had talked to me of what you already kind of mentioned of picking a priority. And if I really had the goal of growing my glutes more, not that you can't 
add muscle while also running, but while adding in that much volume and focusing on something like a half marathon, then it does just pull focus away from training. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do the glute program and prepare for a half marathon. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's like your glutes and hamstrings in running are getting a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. And so then to think that you would be able to also stack on top enough hypertrophy focused volume from a resistance training standpoint is insane. Yeah. Well, I've been hanging out around you too much <laughs> and thought that I could just do anything. And so, but it was great to have that conversation to realize of truly at the core of it, again, my only pull was to really be able to go to Lambo and that I cared way more about growing my glutes. And so it just made a lot more sense to not focus on the running and to focus on the glute program. So as of now, I am finishing up week two of the second round of the glute program and about to get into week three. So if you don't know about the glute program, if you haven't heard us talk about it, it is actually a 16-week program that Alex wrote, and he is a glute genius. And if you don't believe us, you can just ask our clients who he has grown thousands of women's glutes, uh, mine included in that, where I literally used to go from my back down to my legs. I was talking to my sister about it yesterday or the other day she came over to train and we were reminiscing about how we used to get made fun of for literally not having glutes all growing up, not where we genetically store fat, not where we were really blessed. So being able to grow my glutes has been a huge goal for years. And so Alex put together this 16 week glute program and we wanted to give away the first four weeks for free. So those four weeks are available for you to get absolutely free. You do not even need to put in your credit card. But then the second portion of that, so the back end, those 12 weeks are going to be a paid version that you are able to get within our app. So I had run through it before and I had finished that around November, like the end of October into November, then had some personal stuff come up and just wasn't, I didn't have the capacity to train as much because I planned on repeating it soon after finishing it of taking a little bit of a break and then getting back into it. And I just didn't have the capacity. And so I was focusing on a lot of full body movement, just getting my steps in, trying to get um, my food in and then became the second week of February and I got ahead and got started with the glute program round two. So I am loving getting back into it. It's just so fun to have a focus and a goal and to have a training that is already made for me where I don't have to go in and be like, what am I going to do today? It's just here's the plan, go in and get it done. And I will say within getting started, I did kind of psych myself out a little bit because I knew the first time around of how much intention it took and how hard the sessions really are. And so I was kind of, it's kind of like with just leg day in general, how you kind of are realizing how much effort you're going to have to put into it. And you kind of like wear yourself out before you even get into the session. And uh, so the first week, I am actually really proud of myself because I am such a rule follower or I want to do what was laid out. It was really difficult where when I went into the first week and was trying to do everything as it was outlined, that I was just having a hard time even having the ability to get through the full session. And so within my knowledge and also being able to look at the undul undulization there, I was able to move around the volume a little bit to allow myself to get through that first week. And now coming into the second week, because I gave myself some space, I've been able to hit the full volume and really improve within the weight selection and the load selection. And it's been great having all all of the notes from the last time I went through it of what my loads were because I'm seeing myself progress so much faster than I did to begin with. Part of that is because I know the session, I know what the movements are, so I'm not trying to guess weights, and I'm not having that learning period of like how much volume and how much can I really put into this to be able to do the rest of the session for the programmed RPE. Um, so I'm able to kind of cut some of that out. But then it's also of just because I was able to really – grow and gain strength from that program, then being able to start it again, I'm able to start from a higher 
position. So I've been really, really happy so far of how I feel going through it, um, how my performance has been. Um, and I just feel, especially even with getting my hips figured out, I'm feeling a lot more engagement as I'm going through it. So I'm extremely jazzed because from the first time I ran through it, my glute measurement before I started was around a 35 and a half or a 36 inch. At the end of the first round of the glute program, the biggest my glute measurement got was to 39, which I mean, if we're going to take that 36, I'll even go on the high end, three inch in 12 weeks, I'll freaking take it. And then even with having time off of training, not having as much focus on glute training, I maintained most of that and was sitting around a 38 to a 38 and a half measurement. So I was super thrilled to be starting this one with a 38 glute measurement, 38 to 38.5. I'll, you know, I'll take that 0.5 if I can. Um, and so I'm excited to see what I can get to as I keep on rocking and rolling through the rest of it. It's amazing. I will say a clarification is that her having to do the acclimation to the volume is because she did not do the acclimation phase at the beginning. She started with the 12-week paid training mm -hmm. and did not do the four-week introductory phase. If you're doing the four-week introductory phase that is free, that is where your volume allocations are going to get set. So then you're ready to get into the 12 week. And that's why that's there. Yeah. So it was written that way very intelligently. So whatever training you were coming from, that that was able to kind of clean up, get you in the good spot to be able to go into the 12 weeks getting and just get you after it. set within the movement patterns and then also getting set within the total amount of volume that you can handle. So where she's talking about the uh, exercises and feeling comfortable with them, that's what that training is there for. Mm hmm hundred percent. What are the favorite exercises that you um, are doing in the, in the glute program? For the first part, and it's a more of a strength um, in the beginning of the session and then some metabolic work towards the end. Um, I am really, really enjoying both variations of the glute kickback. So there's the glute max kickback and the glute meat kickback. And I think I'm enjoying those even more just because I feel like I have really nailed those down. And especially the first time going through it, I was still kind of getting my bearing. And because my hips were a little bit wonky, I just felt that I wasn't fully. And that's what the issue was. I couldn't get to full hip extension. So now with having that mobility, being able to go through those sessions and those different exercises with James, I'm now in a place where I can get to that full hip extension. I feel very powerful through those movements um, and being able to nail some things down there. And I mean, I will always love a reverse lunge or a drop lunge. Like I I loved it when we did it in the Smith machine. I love it doing it now with the supported arm um, and just being able to really get after that movement. Uh, so I'd say those are probably my top three movements that I'm doing leg-wise right now. That's exciting. The The structure of the 12-week program is at the beginning, you have the strength with a back-end metabolic or endurance-based work, and then that takes you into an extended phase of hypertrophy work. And so you're building on the overall training volume. Um, and I'm excited for all those movements to progress for you throughout the entirety of it. Um, within the the goals, you have, you have the glute measurements. Is there like a you have a shooting for the stars measurement that you would love to see at the end of the program. Is there anything that you're trying to attain? I mean, I've never seen a, a four at That'd the be beginning cool. of that. So being able to see a 40 or a 41 would be awesome. But I also have to mentally remind myself that if my glute measurement is going up in the way that I want to, and even with gaining muscle and minimizing fat gain, there is still a little bit of fat gain there. But it's the aspect that if you're trying to gain muscle and grow your legs, then your legs are going to grow. And I think that that has held me back in the past of you put on clothes and they fit a little bit different and you put on a dress and it's a little bit shorter and you start to get in your head of my clothes aren't fitting. That means I'm getting too big. And I'm trying to remind myself of like, I can't complain about being full if my goal was to eat and my goal is to grow my glutes. And so I can't complain about my measurements going up, especially within my glute measurement um, or maybe the scale weight going up a little bit because muscle is weight. 
Like even if I were to gain no fat, if I wanted to gain muscle and the scale goes up five pounds, I shouldn't look at that as a negative. It should be like, oh, sweet, I gained the muscle that I was working so hard to get after. So it's being able to just continue to trust myself and trust you through the process and being able to get after it uh, and not be worried of, oh, the scale weight went up a little bit or measurements went up a little bit. It's like that's, that's kind of the goal right now. If you were to pinpoint one thing that would hold you back throughout this process, what would that be? And then if there was one thing that had to happen for you to be successful to accomplish that goal, what would that be? Uh, I feel like those answers can semi be the same of the thing that would hold me back would be the thing that I need to do to be able to succeed. But I don't know if I could just say that it's one thing. I think that the main things are going to be the training intensity, because if I don't keep up the intensity, then I'm just kind of moving through space. And that can be mentally difficult to like lock in and have that intensity, but that can make or break your results. So I would say definitely intensity. And then the recovery aspect, which I think includes food and just being able to like sleep and mitigate stress. Because right now I do just have higher stress. And if I don't mitigate any of it, if I don't put in things to be able to deal with my stress, that is only going to kick me in the freaking face. And I might get inflamed. I might have issues with my digestion. I might have issues with my sleep, which is then going to impact my recovery and my results. And so I really need to be aware of recovery. And again, that includes food, where I even was looking at my check-in document, and I've done a good job with protein. I've been super proud of myself of being able to just get in that protein, those Chobani shakes doing their thing, those Nash bars doing their thing. Uh, but, uh, and I've been super happy with getting in my fat macros, getting in my steps, but my carbs have fallen a little bit short. And I think in my head, it's something where I just finished up my cycle. And so during my cycle, I just had a little bit of bloating and it made me uncomfortable. And so then with that, it's like, oh, I don't want to eat as much because I feel uncomfortable. But then going into now I'm ovulating, I had a little bit of just like feeling my ovaries and girls who get it, get it. Um, and so it's something that that can deter you of like, oh, I should eat less because I'm feeling a little bit like bloated or my stomach looks less defined. But I have to like talk myself out of that and remind myself of if I don't have the needed nutrients to recover, I'm only going to look worse. And it's hard to unprogram that where we grew up in the age of like, doing more is always better. Eating less is always better. The only way to look the way you want to is to eat less food. And now I'm having to remind myself of to look the way you want to, you have to eat more food and you have to make sure you hit that. And hitting below your macros isn't oh, that's better than hitting above them. The goal is to hit them. So it doesn't, it's not like, oh, it's better to hit below versus above it's better to hit them. And I just need to keep that in mind. And you wouldn't put macros in place for me that weren't going to allow me to reach my goal. So I just need to follow those. I need to trust that. And I need to check the boxes that I can with like getting my steps, getting my sleep, being cognizant of those things. So I would say intensity and recovery uh, would be those main things that I need to have in place or they will 100% hold me back. Absolutely. So how are you approaching your nutrition? Are you in a, are you around your maintenance? Are you in a surplus? Are you in a significant surplus? How are you going about that? I am in a slight surplus and um, I and we have found that that has been extremely beneficial for being able to still support the performance and recovery that you need while not packing on unnecessary pounds and that's something where, again, that holds a lot of people back if they try to push that surplus too much. I even just had a client that I onboarded and she was like, I don't feel comfortable being in a surplus more than three months. And I was like, three months is the absolute minimum you would need to be in a surplus to gain any muscle. But more so, it would be more towards that six months. And I talked through of how she'd gone about surpluses in the past, and she had really tried to bump up and be like in a big surplus to the point where she felt very uncomfortable. And it's like, could you see 
maybe more benefit for maybe being in a little bit bigger surplus? Possibly. But if you can't be consistent with that, if you can't keep your head in the game long enough to stay in that, then how much does it really benefit you? So been in a slight surplus um, and just being able to, like for me, because I've tracked macros for so long, sometimes I can get into like, oh, I don't need to put as much effort into it. But because we are busy and it is something where just in general, you do need to put effort into what you do. I just recognize what are the things that are holding me back of looking at my food logs, looking at the schedule. And I feel especially in the past week or so, I've done a good job of, uh, okay, if I can't eat a full meal here, but I need to make sure I get in enough food for the day, let me get that shake. Let me get that Chobani yogurt. Let me get that Nash bar in instead of, again, you can kind of have this headspace of um, when you are dieting or at maintenance of like, I'll just wait until the next meal where I'm trying to be a lot more proactive of let me just eat and get something in and be able to pre-plan some days um, and get that nailed down. Awesome. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to fill us in within your training or other things that are going on for you? Um, Nope. I, I just am trucking along right now and keeping my head down and trying to write the the ship, so to speak, of the few things that I'm a little bit off with. And I feel like I've been proactive in those. So I'm excited to continue um, and just keep getting after the training. I'm excited as well. I'm, I am. I think that this time around, because you've done it once, as well as what we have on our plate currently, the weather getting better, it's just going to like mood and, and energy is going to be in a better spot. I think you're going to have crazy results. Yeah. I'm excited for it. Me too. Well, thanks for updating me on everything going on with your training and for asking about mine. But um, I think I'll, I'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you in the next episode.